fucking peep. peep my intro. Because every podcast deserves a good intro. And if you can do it yourself, even better. Uncle Dad's lucky verse. Yes. The clues to share gems, wisdom from those who pay dues to the kings and queens behind the scenes who come to work, planted seeds, and built the dream. Archer Empire, desire for autonomy, dropping tricks of the trade for all of us to peep. Don't sleep, don't, don't sleep. sleep. Wake up to find this knowledge on top, entertainment at its finest. Lo and behold, unfold the hidden scroll. Yeah. It's time to shed the light on the stories untold. This podcast is all we speak the truth. Each one, each one is the good power you who cools. One step beyond the host. Uh-huh. Director of the vibes with a gang of jokes. Gang of jokes. Tell a friend, <laughs> share the wealth of game. Take notes, he's words, folks. Release the chains. Free up the brain with ideas galore. Yeah, yeah. So many career hacks, mentors to explore. Free up the brain with ideas galore. So many career hacks, yeah. mentors to explore for sure. How's that in your headphones? Not too loud? No, it sounds good. All right, cool. The last one I had a DJ on his ears were so sensitive. He's like, yo, turn this shit way down. <laughs> All right. You know, everybody's ears are sensitive. DJs are super sensitive. And he was helping me understand that maybe I should not be listening to my shit so loud, too. <laughs> Yo, what's up? This is Arts Empire Radio. I'm your host, Tion Buku One. We got a special guest here for season two, episode two. My man, Stash ICU. So, how you doing today, man? Doing good, doing good. Man, it was like the world was trying real hard to not make this happen. <laughs> but with a little trip back to Walnut Creek, we got all the sound equipment. We got everything good. So, we're just going to get right into it. Why don't you tell me... And tell the audience who you are, what your company is, and where you're from. Yeah, my name is Stosh Molesky from ICU Art uh, in Creative Unity. We're here in Oakland right now, where I've been living. I'm originally from the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, we started our company, ICU Art, 30 years ago, coming up April 29th of this, this year. It'll be 30 years um, from our first sort of big art exhibitions that we used to do down in L.A., um, working with graffiti artists. Right now, we're really focused on on murals. We have a network of mural walls that we um, use all around the country for murals, temporary murals. Do advertising murals on these walls. We do fine art murals for clients and individuals, and we occasionally still do art exhibitions. Okay. Well, shit, that answers uh, one of my top two questions about what you do, how long you've been doing it. So tell me a little bit about your background, because I know you're an artist, too, but that's not your focal point in your business. So how did you cultivate your passion for the arts? Yeah, so, yeah, you know, I do a lot of art in a sense, but I really don't consider myself an artist. Um, I'm, I'm more of like an art producer, I guess you could say, a curator, a manager, Um I was interested in art. I was studying art history at UCLA and, and uh, graduated in 1991 and in Los Angeles and was just looking around at all the amazing graffiti that was in Los Angeles at that time in the early 90s and was sort of blown away. I was, I was doing some graffiti myself, but it was very unartistic. It was more political and that sort right. of thing. So I was like, wanted to be a part of this art movement. You know, in, in art history, you, you learn about all these great art movements. And I was like, wow. What would be something that's you know, that's of my time and place, and and that was the graffiti, and so, I really wanted to start organizing uh, graffiti art exhibitions, basically with all these amazing artists, and, um, so just happened upon some of the really key figures in the LA graffiti art scene at the time, and um, and we started putting together sort of what they would call pop up shows now in you know used. In, in sort of unused vacant warehouses and storefronts and things like that. Right. Damn. And that was a good time, the early 90s, for graffiti art. I mean, in the Bay, it was amazing. So in L.A., I mean, just from what I've seen from magazines, it was a really good time to be a part of, around, witnessing. 
And so what's cool and one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is you and I share the same like element and passion that we like to represent the arts. We like to represent the artists to be the, the conduit between the artists and the business to make sure they're properly represented, uh, properly paid, um, and also for the clients that the clients, things go accordingly. And, you know, sometimes our artists are artists and mm -hmm. their genius sometimes allows them to be aloof to other things like following up with emails and contracts and <laughs> all that stuff. And that's soul, ex they, some of them would tell me that that's very soul extracting for an artist to have to like get up and do all of the tedious stuff. Um, but I actually ended up loving to do that. That became one of my favorite arts was the business of the art. So that's why I want to have you on because the more we got to know each other, it was like, oh, okay, this man is like, his full focus is representing this space that I occupy. And so you're like an unknown mentor because if I'd have known you long before, it might have saved me some mistakes. So, uh, so how did you make the jump from just seeing art as a passion to actually getting into it as a business? Well, I think that happened pretty quickly. Um, just, you know, the mechanics of trying to put on art exhibitions and, and produce murals that, you know, you need cash, you know. I mean, of course, I had, you know, many a second, third night job and all that stuff. I mean, you know, I think we started as a crew of friends and, and that shared a passion for art and, and graffiti and and DJing and, and just sort of hip hop and, and, you know, reggae music and that sort of thing based in Venice Beach. Um, that was a very fertile ground in the early 90s. Um, you know, it was, wasn't the high end, you know, rental neighborhood that it is today, right. it, you know, it was a bit of a hood. And, and so you could sort of exist there for not too much money in those early days. And, you know, working nights as a graphic designer and, you know, waiter and all that stuff. So, you know, you need that second, third, fourth job and you need mentors for sure because you know i was I, when my mentor was robbie canal he's he's a political street artist and poster artist um based in la and um you know he sort of took me under his wing and i and i worked for him for free for years and really benefited in 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 terms of seeing the art world from a lot of perspectives that he was he had been through and that was a big help to, to right. me. And also it gave us a lot of credibility because he was pretty well known in the graffiti art world and mm. for doing his street posters that were going up on the street. So when I could show those posters and, and to some of these graffiti artists, they, 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 they reacted really well to that. And they, right. and, and also I could show them my graffiti, you know, that I was doing is so that they, you know, they realized I was somewhat, you know, I wasn't a cop or right, something right, like that. Right, and right. it was a lot of suspicion back then. I was, you know, but also I think I was blessed by the fact that I wasn't clearly really an artist, you know, so that right. I'm, I'm not like competition or in, and in that way. And, and basically my only route to be involved was to organize, you know, right. And, and, you know, try to make these things happen for these, these, these truly amazing artists. Right. And, you know, dealing with whether it's hip hop culture or specifically graffiti art, there's such a code and there's such a level of trust within and distrust without, um, and being able to, like you're saying, have an elder, have someone be an ambassador guiding and blessing you and linking you with these artists that I know back then as a graffiti writer back then, we were very not open to outside people. We wouldn't even tell the people our, our writer names. Like now it's just so common. People right. yell out Buku on the street and I'll turn around, but you yelled out Buku <laughs> in 92. I'm not turning around. Like it's, you know, it could be anybody. Um, so that ambassador, that ambassadorship and having that cultural, like, elder guide you in is is a very important thing to break into certain cultures like ours like graffiti art hip-hop culture back then i mean now it's hip-hop culture anybody can walk in and just kind of start doing business but back then you kind of had to like you know you couldn't just walk in and be like yo okay here's the deal we're about to do this yeah and and i was literally like showing pictures of my stuff to and and you know to these artists to just sort of show them i was i was i was for real and you know i wasn't total outsider even though i was to a degree an outsider i hadn't grown up in la so i grew up in san francisco so i had right. i really wasn't really that versed in the la scene and and in that in that sense i was a bit naive and so i i just pushed forward and and what was weird is that i i ended up with these contacts and very diverse crews you know that probably would have never right, been together <laughs> Be, if I had known better, I, I probably would have thought, oh, I can't put, you know, AWR with CBS. Like, right. they don't get along or, you know, they get along now, I think. But 
back then they didn't yeah. and you know no one would have thought to put them together in a right. in a show or you know i remember um i think i was trying to get hex hex in in the show and then I was trying to get Frame in the show, and those two guys were hated each other. And Frame's like, "I'm not gonna be in a show with Hex is in it." And Hex is like, "I'm not gonna be in a show right. if Frame is in it." And then neither of them were in the show, you know. So there was a lot of that back then, and I just kind of like stumbled through it, and somehow, you know, it worked out. So yeah, well, that naivete is a blessing in the sense because most people would have just not done it, and then you'd have this very partitioned situation. Like when I first went to Australia on the music tip you know like i'm just there opening for these artists that i brought down there and so i'm just like a big kid in a candy store i open and the people who brought us out there were graffiti writers right but at the show like i'm just after the show selling merch and these other writers are like yo like we got a wall do you want to paint on your day off and i'm like yeah so i go paint with them the day off and then they later my boys are like oh dude who'd you paint with like oh, i painted with so-and-so ah oh, i wish you would have told us and it's like because the crews like from the 80s graffiti was like the prominent part of hip hop in Australia. So as the crews in the 80s grew out, some got into the record label side, some got into like the, the record store side, some got into like the marketing and promotion, some got into booking and they didn't all get along. So it was very segregated. So it took someone like outside to be like, yo, I'm just representing hip hop. Like I'm not trying to get too deep into that specifics and it took us to kind of push some things forward so that's really cool so this podcast is really focusing on the business of the arts the share like the behind the scenes work that it takes to like successfully navigate um either turning your art into a business or just being a keeper of the business just weaving art and commerce involved so we're gonna really focus on that so what was one of your first tough lessons you learned in this world of like business and art intertwined well, I mean, so so many lessons, but I, I think that, I mean, it's going to be a 24 hour experience at some point, <laughs> you know, right, it's, right. It's, it put it in writing, you know, get your crew together, get them to help you. And, you know, mentors are key, sponsors are key. And, you know, when there's an opportunity, you got to take it and, you know, get in where you fit in because, um, and, and for me that, that came in a lot of different ways, you know, just key people like, you know, Ash from Con Art you know, coming through with his, his, you know, probably 10,000 square foot warehouse right. you know, that he let us do our first show and for free. Cause we had lost our other, you know, warehouse spot at the last minute, you right. know, like, I mean, there, there's so many people, you need these people to help you. You need your crew to bring these people forward to you. You can't do this stuff in isolation. Um, and, you know, get it down on paper because that's, what's going to distinguish you from the other people that just have good ideas in their head. Right. So when you mean, when you say get it down on paper, what do you mean specifically? I mean, you know, get your proposal down, you know, it's on a one sheet because, you know, it, you know, obviously now it's over the internet and email and such, but I can tell you how far that goes and how much that distinguishes you from everybody else that has a good idea, but never puts it in writing. Right. And, um, and, you know, put your, put your own skin in the game, you know, you're going to need some money and to, to start it off, but you can, you know, now you can do things like crowdfund and, and, and things like that because, and to get you that seed money. That's really important. Right. Um, you know, but outline the benefits for the people that you're trying to work with, you know, what w literally like in a, you know, like a 10 point, this is what you're going to get. You know, you're going to get, you know, for a sponsor, you're going to get your name on the flyer. You're going to get your name on a poster. You're going to, you know, get notices on radio interviews and all this and, you know, get that PR team because now it's like a social media team, but that was one of the things that was really important to us was sort of penetrating the media in a sort of covert way in terms of having the photos, having the press releases right. so that, you know, you make it easy for them to do stories about you, you know, and that that's, that's gonna, what is, is what really did help bring those jobs in. So we do these big art exhibitions in, in these warehouses with these big graffiti artists and, and they were almost like raves, you know, it's like we couldn't even release the location till, you know, the night of, right, and, you know, right. call into a phone number and, you know, we didn't quite go to a, a map point, but, it, you know, it was, it was like that level because it was very controversial, sort of politically motivated stuff at the time. So, and, and graffiti artists were essentially being tracked and hounded by the, right, by right. the authorities at the time. So stuff for it, yeah. yeah, it had to be somewhat covert and, and that's not great for business, you know, right. <laughs> right, right. it's really not. So, 
I mean, I remember we had people from the LA Times that had gotten the flyer. They want to know where it's at. We're like, sorry, we're not going to let right. you know until the <laughs> night of the event. And right. this is terrible for PR, but I right. mean, it can create some mystery, but um, so I guess it's a fine line, but. Right. It's like, um, who's this CBS crew? Can you tell me who Skate is? Is he going to be there? Can yeah, I meet him? <laughs> right. <laughs> You're like. Uh... Yeah. And Skate, Skate was super important. Like I just happened upon Mr. Skate at, I think like another art exhibition and, you know, he took a liking to me and that was super key because, you know, he was like, oh, this sounds like a great idea. You know, right. oh, I'm, I'm CBS crew. And, and you know, he, then that just led to like all these other artists and, and that were already working with him and that or that were already at con art and that sort of thing. So that was that was really key. And then, you know, really, you know, it's like one one or two solid people. Then that really helps bring in other people, obviously. Right. So that that's and gives you some credibility. Um, right. So the tough lesson, tough lesson would be in summary was just really articulate your vision and write it down like actually be yeah. a, there's a level of professionalism that comes with writing it down and submitting a proposal that is written as opposed to just here let me just tell you about it yeah now give me your money you're allowed right. to get your venue and stuff like that yeah um, people will give you a break you know if they they see that determination you yeah know. i mean i know in our age like now we're we're elders and we have you know, we work with peers who've been doing this stuff for a long time, and then we work with new people who are coming up who maybe want to get in involved, whether they're, you know, a mural artist or someone that wants to work with us. And I, I do tend to try to create some type of professional hoops for them to jump through. And one of them would be, like, write it out. Like, what are you looking for? What are you offering? And just get them in that process of starting to treat these things in a professional, like, there's a, there's a, a code. There's kind of a way to do this to present yourself um, and just teaching skills like that. Yeah, we we were, and our goal was to try to not just do everything for these artists, but actually share the knowledge with them so that they could do it themselves, and and in maybe in some ways that is counter counterproductive to the concept of trying to like keep all that knowledge. But I mean, you know, we were we were working with like fifty or sixty artists right. in these exhibitions. There's no way it, I I I I thought I could represent all of them, but in the end, I realized I could not. You right. know, I could I couldn't be the representative for all these people. So you know, it was good that they, they took some information from what we were trying to do, which is trying to have, you know, museum quality exhibitions and, and all that we had, you know, because I had been through that world in the art history world and the museum world and that sort of thing. So I, t I could, was able to share that with them. And I think they saw that and they appreciated that. Um, I, I think the other big thing and this sort of our MO of how we made it work was we would get a big commercial job and then we would take that momentum that money that space and then do a fine art exhibition right you right. know because i mean you can't count on fine art sales i mean it's just almost impossible that you can never tell what somebody's gonna like right you know who's gonna who they're gonna who they're gonna like or the quality of the art that's gonna come through and if, if somebody's gonna react to it and, and want to pay money for it so you know you have to have so we would we were blessed to get some big commercial jobs you know Right. And then we would, and, and we were all about graffiti artists, so we would have those artists do the the commercial job, and then from there we would we would take the money, the momentum, and the space, and do a fine art exhibition. Right, right, okay. So, what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions are about working in the arts for business wise for an artist and for a person who's going to be a manager, a curator of representing artists? I mean, I think it's a really tough world out there now because one thing I've found is there's always a bigger fish. So it's like, you know, out there going to gobble, gobble up. Like if you if you're representing artists and you do an amazing show for for an artist and they sell out all their art. Well, that's great. But that also somebody's going to probably come in and be like, hey, you want to come over to my gallery now right. <laughs> to that artist. So right. right. And, and, you know, artists kind of look at it like, well, that's my art. And, and of course I deserve it, you know. Right. And, and, and they and they probably do but at the same time as like you know where does that leave you so it, it's kind of tough I think what we found with the exhibitions is that you kind of need to just base it on the artwork that's in that exhibition you can't necessarily look to represent these artists in all aspects of their lives and their careers because it's just now the way with the social media and Instagram and things like that it's like everybody has access to these artists right. and, and these graffiti artists aren't trying to be anonymous anymore. Right. 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 You can <laughs> Whereas DM in the past, their DMs there was like, definitely a service that you were providing by being an intermediary between people that were trying to get in touch with them 
and right. themselves. So that's sort of been flipped on its head and, and, you know, everybody has access to these artists essentially. Um, so you have to find out what you're worth. What are you bringing to the table, you know, as, as, as a manager, as a curator, as a producer and, and just and be happy with that. Make sure that's going to be something that makes it for you and right, so that you right. can continue to do this for these artists and be there. If you don't make enough money to do it a second time, then, you know, it was a great show, but you right. Know, you can keep it moving. Where does that leave you? Right. So th there is a, a different definition or breakdown of what loyalty is as a manager dealing with artists and artists dealing with us as like managers on the manager side is that, you know, like you're saying, like, an, you would, one would assume that if you do a good job for your artist, they're going to stay loyal to you. But like you're saying, there's always a big fish. So if you do a really good job, <laughs> you might attract somebody who, in the artist's mind, can take them to the next level, and they will. I mean, they they will leave. I mean, they I, have yeah. Left. I mean, I think I, this brings us a little concept of friends and family, and I definitely feel like this is like friends and family that we've been working with, and some of these artists I've been working with for like 30 years, 25, right. 20 years. Right. I'm still working with them. And, you know, you need to have that communication so that you guys can 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 grow. And hopefully they do, you know, recognize your value. You right, know what I'm saying? Right. But, you know, just don't be surprised if they have to leave. You know, maybe they take you with them. You right, know, I think right. that's that's what you can hope for, I think. You know, and then you can be their personal manager. You can be their curator. You know, you, you, know, you can be a producer and, you know, produce the exhibition. You know, maybe... But you have to be open to those bigger, bigger opportunities, right. you know, and you can't, I mean, you're not always going to be the one that, that's the rainmaker, you know, it's like, it's going to come from sometimes outside of, of your immediate, you know, contacts and such. So, right. I mean, that's one of the things I learned um, was the mortality of a manager. <laughs> I mean, that was a big thing for me is like, you know, you dedicate your, your life and time and focus to an artist. Like I was with the artist for 10 years um and then i realized that at any time that artists can stop working like literally just take a sabbatical or go you know or just not work with you mm -hmm. and so some of the like my artists took a sabbatical like a long time like a burnout i didn't burn out any time off and that time off was going to be a few months turned into like a year and it devastated my income uh, cause that was my primary focus. And I realized quickly after that, I needed to adjust my business model to, uh, have room for these things, <laughs> you know, which meant diversify what I do and not just be solely tied to one artist. Um, but what are some tips that you would give like an artist, like a manager to that would increase the ability of some possible staying power and some loyalty with the artists you work with? I mean, it's hard to say, you know, I think, you know, you can have those discussions, um, but I think that, you know, you just have to really, you have to just create your own lane in terms of, you know, a, an area that where you're just bringing proven value to, right. to the relationship instead of you can't, you can't just sit back and let stuff come to you. So, you know, um, make that stuff clear and, um, you know, hopefully that they, it's appreciated. I mean, you know, you can do contracts and agreements and things, you know, those are tough. Like a lot of people don't in the arts world, they're, they're a little reluctant to, to jump on like an agreement, a written agreement. Right. So it's hard, but, um, it's a lot, of, a lot of handshakes then, huh? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, <laughs> to be honest, like we, we're still primarily a handshake business, you know right. what I mean? I mean, that's, I put a lot of weight on that and, and, you know, I, I, and it, and it's been good to us, but you know, we've gotten burned right. and, and over the years and, and that's tough, you know, yeah. um, not usually by the artist, but, um, you know, by outside businesses and such. And, um, you know, it's, it's really tough to, to have a, you know, go for like a lawsuit and things like that these days. Um, it's so expensive. It's so timely. Right. You know, even if you get a judgment, it doesn't mean, you know, anybody is ever going to pay you. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, a handshake is really important, truth. you know, and I, I enjoy working in the graffiti art world because, uh, it is a community and, um, that's what we focus on is artists that started as graffiti artists. And, right. and I, I want to continue that. And, and in some ways that means so much to me because I just believe that, I mean, one of the main things we're doing is keeping artists working and we can't always be managing their fine art careers at this point. So we're more focused on commercial murals. Right. Right. Um, but that allows them to be fine artists in many ways. And I hope they appreciate that. And, and, 
even and they have to and they kind of have to pursue that fine art career and um they're free to do that and hopefully we give them the time and the money that they can do that right you know in, a, in essence and at the same time that they're ready to work when we have projects and you know stuff comes last minute and that sort of thing and 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 what i love is that they do give me that time and that trust that you know that that they're gonna they're gonna be there when we need them and what's amazing about these graffiti artists is they're so resourceful and creative in terms of how they get stuff done working right. together as a team and and how they create is is really special right so okay for fun what are some of your favorite pros for working with graffiti artists in the business world I mean, like I said, they're very resourceful. They're very fast. They they are they have no problem working in public. Right. So like, if you're looking over their shoulder, they're not tripping on that. Like, I mean, I can tell you like art school kids and stuff like that, and you know they like to work in private and right, they don't right. want somebody looking over their shoulder, and they're just like you know hurt by critique. I mean, so I think that that's really great. I think that. At this, you know, on the flip side, sometimes, you know, sometimes graffiti artists sort of built on the concept of tricks, visual tricks. I mean, all art is, you know, trompe l'oeil, trick in the eye. Right. But at the same time, I mean, graffiti took it to a new level. I mean, because they're always trying to do the quickest thing to, for the right. highest impact. Right, right, right. So, you know, and now in today's world of like photorealistic graffiti art, right. you know, and rendering, you know, we're, we're doing commercial art advertisements we're doing, you know, um, celebrity portraits, right. photorealistic <laughs> portraits, probably never meant to be painted, right. probably meant right. to be digitally printed on a billboard. Right. But the client's giving us this artwork and we got to paint it. And so we've had to level up from there. And I, you know, these artists are good, but I think they got better by doing right. this high level of art under a microscope with a high level of critique. Right. And I think, you know, my, one of my roles is to be a great observer of that art and be a critic and be able to have that relationship with these artists to say, that's good, but, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe a little to the left, a little to the right, right a little darker, a little lighter and having the, the language and the understanding of the art enough to, for that to be helpful and not, not just problematic. Right. And, you know, just from my little time with you working on the Wakanda Forever mural stuff is you're translating, you're the conduit between the client who wants this very specific stuff and this very talented artist who has their style and their skill. And so having the ability and the relationship with the artist to, when you critique them, they understand you're not critiquing their talent. You're critiquing what the client wants and how to manipulate what they can do to make sure that they get what they want. Yeah. Um, and that's a skill in itself. Um, and part of that, like you're saying, goes back into your guys' relationship rapport with the artist. It's a friends and family thing. So now what are some of the challenges of working with graffiti artists? Well, I think we you mentioned style. And I think that that's, that's a challenge because like we get two types of art. So we do these commercial murals all over the country. You know, most of them are are advertisements essentially. And they're sometimes the artwork is just handed to us by the client and they don't necessarily want the artist's style in there. So right. it's like what we call this, like a rendering job. So you're, you're rendering the client artwork. And so it's somewhat devoid of style to a degree you're utilizing the artist's going to utilize everything they have as far as techniques and things. But in, in a sense, it can't necessarily, it's not necessarily supposed to look like, um, you know, a painting by Vogue or Swank right. or <laughs> Axis right. or whatever. So that's, that's tough, but, um, you know, I think that they understand it and they, they've adapted in, in a sense. Um, we do do fortunately we do a lot of stuff where we actually do do the design where they're looking for these artists to do the design bring their style bring their original design to that and then that gives them a lot more freedom you right. know it's a lot more difficult to render someone else's art to be right. honest than you know than to just paint your own art you know because somebody's going to say they know that doesn't look exactly right or right. you know the color is slightly off when it's your artwork you can be like that's exactly the way i wanted it and then the clients can be like great you know, right. There's like a big difference there and we kind of do both. And I think that, you know, we kind of just take all comers in terms of clients. And that's one of the main things that we've always tried to do is that, 
And I think that's one of the benefits that we offer is that wherever the twists and turns of this project will go, we, we are going to accommodate that client. Right. We're very client centric in that way. And I think that that is what has given us the return business over right. the years. The longevity, you know? and, yeah. And that's me, that's me and, and my wife, Gina Penn, you know, ma- working to make that work for the artist and, and making it work for the client and, and trying to make sure that the artist is, is, is feeling okay with it and, and has the support and the pay that they need to, to work like that. And, you know, the technical issues, whether, you know, you know, whether that's projectors or, or, you know, different things to, you know, proper printouts and, you know, things like that. So, you know, so that things go smoothly, that they're not just, not everything's being put on them. So, you know, we're trying to, we're definitely breaking up aspects of the job. So, so that they're not doing everything and they're not getting burnt out on, on everything. Right. You know, so that they're doing one aspect of it. All right. Well, that leads us to the next thing, pricing, you know, this is a big one for, you know, I like to talk about this with every person I have on because everyone price is different. Um, and most of us as artists and as managers have uh, underpriced ourselves at some times and then probably overcorrected and overpriced ourselves. I th- yeah, I, th- <laughs> I think pricing is one of the most difficult things and it's very unique to the situation. I think that, let's be honest, there's like... For fine art world, I do encourage artists to have a set price for their work. Right. Whether they're selling to a gallery, they're selling to a collector, they're selling to friends and family, there should be a set price, but at the same time, you can discount that price. Right. But there should be an established price. So, and I think that, you know, if you're, and for your homie, you know what I mean? Like, then let's establish that price. And then you're giving a discount on it, right? You know, for that person for whatever reason, because they're another. If they're an art dealer, let's let's right. let's give discounts to those people because you know that's a standard industry thing. Like if it's another art dealer, they need to make their money and recognize that. You right. know what I mean? Like pay these people for the job that they do, even though it may not seem like a lot to you. All they did is hook me up with this other buyer. Well, right. Okay, but are they going to do that again? If you don't right. give them the twenty percent, <laughs> right? They're not. Right. And you don't get, you know, and also recognize, have respect for their contact. You know, that's still their contact. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so it doesn't mean you can now call them directly necessarily unless, you know, you guys have discussed that. So right. have respect for contacts and, and pay people for what they bring to you. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, there's going to be different prices, you know, I mean, based on who the client is. I mean, if it's... If it's a, I mean, it sounds a little weird, but like for commercial jobs, but um, I mean, you can say it's worth ten, twenty thousand for you to paint this mural, but if they don't have it, you're not going to get it. Right. So, I mean, you got to work with them and their budget, um, and um, but you can let them know what the discount is so they right. appreciate it at least. <laughs> right. So I'm hearing like, regardless of what you end up agreeing to, you should always let people know what your set price is. Yeah. And then discount at least the, the value of what you're doing remains at the level that you valued it as yeah i think i i hear a lot of people trying to do different things to try to price stuff i you know i hear artists coming with us square footage yeah you know i think i think that's tough I, I never see that working because of just the sheer variation in terms of what the artwork could be right right that right, right. it's just it maybe be huge wall but simple art you know right, or it could be right. you know especially for graffiti artists spray can artists it's, it's actually really hard to work super small right. sometimes so, so scale know, is they could give you a high. tiny wall and then but it's super detailed right and it's totally <laughs> difficult to do so way more stressful than doing a two-story so, building yeah so yeah, i yeah. think you know you yeah i think it's hard to have set prices um i think that you really need to customize these prices for, for the, for the location, for the artwork, for the client. Let's be honest. You know what I mean? Like, you know, there's going to be a different client for the big super corporate client and the, and the mom and pop or the local or the nonprofit. But, you know, I've, we reserve super nonprofit discounts for actual nonprofits. Okay. Let's, let's (laughs) let's talk about that. Cause it's like, you know, just your, your homies good cause is, is not, you know, may or may not be worthy of the nonprofit discount, you know? Right. I mean, there's real nonprofits that are really doing good work. And those are the people that we, you know, like to reserve those prices for. Right. So as a manager, like how, 
So what I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is help up and coming artists or up and coming managers of artists to like get some tools or a checklist to go about quantifying or creating this equation to price their work. Well, let me tell you this. Um, you know, your work should be priced at what you've sold it for at the past. And that the point is it's supposed to go up in the right. future right. incrementally. And so it's like they have an opportunity to buy it now at this price. Next exhibition, it's going to go up. And that benefits your collectors because they got in early. And right, that encourages right, right. them to get in early because, and, you know, when you're starting out, I, you know, I can't emphasize, you know, this is for fine art, you know, gallery stuff is, is creating small works and prints for those, right. those, those, those collectors that don't have the money, you know, and then having some bigger works that are more expensive and, and right. for those big time collectors that have the money, but definitely always trying to have something small, some, you know, some sort of reproductions, um, you know, hand embellishing prints is an amazing thing, right? right like right. G clays that you can print in your house, but then you hand embellish those things and right. make them custom original, sign them, put a number on it. And then that collector, it becomes your biggest supporter, right? You know, because they're now invested in you and they're going to, they're going to promote you. You know, they're going to get more money in 10 years and they're going to buy a big piece or they're going to tell their friends about it. You know, and then, and that's how you have to start. You start low and then it goes up from there. And that's the same with commercial jobs. You know, right. if you're if you're just saying my, my mural start at 10K, but you can't get a can't get anybody to bite. Then right. Then maybe you, you, <laughs> you know, you, you got to start. You got to start a little lower. Right. And that's and that's the challenge. Like when I was, you know, I managed and did booking for you know independent hip hop artists. And, you know, I would usually ask him just for a range. What's your high and what's your low? Like, what do you, you know, what do you want and what are you willing to go for? And some of them will be like, well, I ain't doing nada if I don't get 5K a show. And I'd be like, okay. And then I had to be like, well, in my mind, knowing what I know with who I work with, I might be able to get you three of those a year. So you'll net 15K in that year. Or I could probably get you 60K income in a year if you're willing to do 20 shows you know and so trying to explain to the artist like what is your goal is your goal this value is your goal this annual income and trying to like help them just see perspective like you're saying like if you want 5k you may only get two of those a year if you're like rigid but if you're a little bit more flexible you might be able to get more work and yeah so that ties into what you're talking about yeah, I think, you know, I think that they, they need to trust in you and give you some time to build, you know, I was watching the, the Wu-Tang documentary, well, not a documentary, it's like a Hollywood version oh, of the, the Wu-Tang. Yeah, yeah, the saga. And, you know, he, you know, Rizzo got five years out of these guys, right, you know, right, like, right. trust me, you know, and they trusted him, you know, I mean, to, to build on that and to develop it and, you know, you can do art, that's what you are, an artist, so right. it doesn't it doesn't take everything out of you to do a show or to, to, to paint a painting, you know? Right. But I mean, you have to be okay to, to make that sale. I mean, I always put it to the artist in the end, like, because some people have, you know, particularly, particularly sentimental piece. Right. 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 right or a particularly right. important yeah. piece, you know, that they don't want to part with. Well, don't, don't, cause you're not going to feel good about it. Right. Make prints of it. You right. Know? There you go. That's a good way. So now with the mural stuff, cause you know, like, I've been at your compound and I've been frequenting your compound. <laughs> Every time I go, I figure, like, I, I just see something else there. You know, like, you have the ladders and the lifts and the drills. And, I mean, there's so many things that you've invested in in your business. So when you go about pricing a mural, you know, what are the factors? Like, what are, you know, there's artists, obviously, but then there's also all your expenses like how do you navigate and weave all of that into your pricing yeah i mean you know excel spreadsheets that's what you know i think the google's got their got their sheets uh that you can do online for free you know you don't have to buy microsoft office but um yeah i mean and using that template to just fill it out per job you know i'm, right. I'm reusing that template where i've got everything on there that could possibly think about and, you know, and this is going to help you with your taxes, too, because then, you know, all that stuff's expenses right. and itemized. stuff. So it's, it's right. itemized. And um, so, you know, in, in validating stuff. And the other thing that is hard for me, but now I do it more, is putting my time in there and saying, you know, as a manager or a right. producer, <laughs> right. what's my time? There's actually value to what we do. <laughs> right. And putting that in there because, you know, the other thing is that it may turn out that you don't have time to be that person. So you have to pay somebody to be that person. So right. then now you need to have it in the budget. Right. And right, that, right, right. you know, so it's like, 
and just try to get everything in the budget because otherwise we're unrealistic of what we're really profiting on these jobs yeah. and and um and it, yeah it's depressing sometimes yeah. but um <laughs> what are the hardest things volume i mean it's, it's about volume it's right like volume, so i think yeah. that's a big clue this is a big united states with 350 million people in right. it and tons of cities all over right. so it's like I think that, you know, you look at all these tech companies, how do they make their money? Well, because they're accessing, you know, 7 billion people in the world. Right, right. Right. So it's like they're making pennies per transaction, but they're making a lot but of transactions. Game, so, right. so I think that that volume is a key to getting to the point of, of subsistence in some ways. Right. But that's our route. That's that's one route that we do. That's and that's possible because we're a manager and a crew and a company. Right. And so we just take everything that comes and figure it out. Figure out one way to do it right. or another. That doesn't mean the artists have to. One artist doesn't do it all. Right. Right. So right. I think it's hard for one artist who's just an artist and that's their company. They can't do that because they're like, well, I'm working on this particular mural for this month, and then I have another mural right. in a it's month, another month. Yeah. But then that's the benefit of a manager, right? Right, or Agent. a crew, yeah, or crew. a team. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, one of the one of the hard lessons that I learned, and then I try to share, is the difference between gross and net. You know, and my wife is much more understanding of the business and compliance of it, so she helps me understand that when I, you know, negotiate a deal for ten k for this, you know, mural or whatever it is, um, and then I want to pay the artist eight. You know, she's like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> like, you have gas. Right. You have, you know, supplies. You have whatever. Maybe it's travel. Uh, there's just so many things that at least should be factored in. Then there's your time. And that's one of the things as a manager with these gigs is like, I would forget to factor in my time and I would forget to factor in the overhead. And so there'd be times where I'd get a 10K gig, I'd pay out eight and I'd lose three. Yeah, because my overhead was five, you know, or what, you know, whatever it was like. Um, so just just for the for the audience, just like let's just say one mural gig, just run down an itemized list of what the expenses are that go into that. Like, what does it take? Well, you know, obviously you got paint, you know, and we break this down into like things like, you know, buff paint, bucket paint, spray paint, you know, printouts. Um you know, do you have to pay for the wall or not? You know, um, is there going to be maintenance on the wall? Um, your other laborers who are going to prep that wall or, or, you know, um, help you, you know, get the image up onto the wall, whether that's like with a projection or a pounce or, or, you know, a grid system, whatever. I mean, right. that's very typical and common that the artists are going to go through some sort of process to get that image onto the wall, um, you know, in one way or another. So, um, all those things need to be part of the budget. You know, do you have to pay for a, a, a rental of a lift? Right. Ladders, you know, gas food, you know, all that sort of stuff really gets into that budget. And, um, you know, I think what we're what we're trying to level up is having production managers. And I think that's one of the main things that we feel like we need. Right, right. Is production managers, for example, because, um, you know, the artist looks at it one way, the client looks at it another, right, you know, right. and it's like, <laughs> you know, this is done. Like the artist is like, it's done. I'm done. You know, and you're like, hmm, you know, right. <laughs> it's like you have to look at it Let critically, me get back right? right? Photographers need to document it quickly, get you, get it reviewed and that sort of thing. Because, right. and um, so any production managers out there, that's what we're, we're, we're looking for. Right. Um, um, that. And, but it's hard. It's hard to find that that room in the budget, to be honest. Right. And and um, but it's needed. Um, you know, just to make sure everybody's safe, everything's getting done, everything's you know in where it's supposed to be, that sort of thing, and things are moving along. You know. Yeah. So you guys hear that? It's a lot of shit that goes in to these things. So even if you're just a crew, or you're up and coming artist crew, and you got a mural gig, and you're you're trying to price this gig. And you start like calculating how much money each, each person in the crew is gonna make, like factor in all these expenses, and then work backwards and see what's left and divide it up amongst the crew. Because you know I've had times on tour where, you know, I would get I would collect the guarantee, and I would take out my fifteen percent or whatever my booking or whatever, and I would just give the artist the money. And then when I started managing Dell and he had an attorney, 
and we did tours. And he's like, no, you collect all the money. You give stipends or per diem if someone needs or an advance during the tour. All the money goes back home. And we do accounting at the end of the tour because we have to factor in tour met, tour bus, gas, hotels, unexpected expenses. And all of that comes out of the gross before the net. And then the money gets paid to the artist based upon net. And so then I tried to go back to my original artist. I'm like, dude, I learned how to do this shit. This is going to be great. I'll just collect the money each night on tour, and then we'll do accounting afterwards. And they were like, no, dude, just pay me out each night. I'm like, well, well you're paying me a percentage, and you end up paying me off of gross, meaning you're paying me way more than your net. And he's like, you know what? Just give me the money. I'll, I'm like, all right. And I try to like explain that, but most artists assume gross is net. Like if you get a gig, if you get a show for 10k, you're walking home with 10k, you know, and you you had to factor in, and, and like the DJ of the guy would have to argue with him to get paid. Well, yeah, and I think that that's one of our big, my big roles as a production, as a producer, essentially, I guess you could say, of of a mural project is that I'm estimating what it's going to cost. I'm going to estimate what I'm going to pay these these people. Maybe some people are on hourly, you know, some people are on contract uh, for a specific amount, but right. I'm kind of absorbing that, taking that responsibility and saying, look, if I, you know, I'm, I'm just, this is a $10,000 job and I'm going to pay you as an artist, you know, 5,000. And, you know, it's like my responsibility to make sure it happens. And if it doesn't, then that's, that's my capitalist risk factor yeah, that right. I wasn't able to do. You know, I didn't right. properly estimate it. I didn't foresee this going to happen and I didn't make any money on it. Right. You know? And so, you know, I think that that's, that's the goal and that's how you can move quickly because, um, you're just taking that responsibility on right. yourself. And right. that's, that's the exact sort of the, in many production, in many fields, that's sort of the, the role of the executive producer. Right. And I, I feel like, in, and in some respects, we did model our, our business on the film industry in many ways, because right. that coming up in LA and, and that was the model, a creative industry that was like so established and right. so, so clear cut in many ways and, and profitable, clearly, right. you know, well-paid workers, highly skilled, right. highly creative. And, and I think that that's in many ways what we modeled our business after in many ways. So, um, yeah, that's dope. I mean, having the just understanding to look to the film industry to model it after that, because that's I mean, that's been going on for so long. There's a wealth of information on how to manage big projects and productions and stuff like that. So that's another good tip is like, you know, don't try to make a full, complete understanding of a decision before doing research. There's probably people as if you're an artist or a becoming manager, there are people who have done what you're trying to do on many different levels. So allow yourself to be curious to go find out and not slam the table. All right. So now one more thing about pricing. So one of the things that I was, that I really, you know, took from you from just the time we spent in LA is like, you know, when you get a mural gig, there is a difference of pricing from executing the mural and a, a, a client that wants you to design a mural. And this is where a lot of myself and my friends have gotten stuck is that we agree to do the, the gig for, you know, let's just say 10 K. Um, and we don't price in the sketching and the revisions. And then we get lost in revisions. The next thing you know, by the time we're painting it, we're exhausted. We hate the gig and we feel like we're losing money. So you explained to me that the design part is, is a separate thing. And could you elaborate? Well, yeah, I think that? that we're really good at into trying to compartmentalize all aspects of the job. And this is tough with clients because they don't always come along and you can end up losing some jobs. And I think in, right. in essence, the, the bottom line with pricing is you have to essentially be ready to walk away from the job. Right. Right. And that can be super hard for an artist as you, if you're the manager and then, you know, the artist has to really trust you and see that you can bring bring the rain because if you consistently lose jobs because you're shooting too high, that they're, they're you know, they could have they could have taken it for, you know, you're trying to get 10K because you got to pay yourself and right. and like everybody shit, and, and get the artist, yeah. you know, 5K or something. But, they, you know, if they had just taken the job themselves, they would be like, well, I would have got 10K, you right, know, right, so. Right. So where, where, how's that, you know? Um, so they have to trust you and you have to shoot 
you have to shoot high, just a little bit high, just a little bit uncomfortable with your with your client, right? right like right. they should feel like, oh, that's just a little more than I wanted to pay. That's, right. There, there you go. You, you came <laughs> in with the perfect number, right? right. Like, um, you know, if they're like, if they if they approve it too quick, you not might have been a little too right. low. We've all had that. They're like, oh, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. You're like, oh shit, because you can't go back yeah. and. But so what we try to compartmentalize all aspects of it. So everybody's, this is the key. This is, this, I think this is the phrase for 2023 that I've been hearing a lot is scope of work, right? Right. That's S-O-W is, uh, that's, that seems to be, I know it's scope been around of work. Okay. scope of work yeah. because you know what you define that scope of work because, di- and, and then you get paid for every itemized item in it, you right. know, because, and then when the scope of work changes, then you you know they got to pay for that right right you know so it's like and then you got to like mission creep right as the expanding <laughs> scope of work you know right. so like oh can you guys just make video of that right right it's not a big deal right <laughs> or like wait what's the terminology it's creep was it like mission creep or like uh, ex- mission expanding creep. scope of work <laughs> because it's like okay now I need you guys to post on social media right right you know okay and um I need to review those posts. Right. <laughs> and I need to have these particular hashtags. You know, that right. is what I define as, you know, an expanding scope of work. You right. know, and not everybody bl- understands it, but you know, our theory is that we're going to try to give you the lowest price possible. Right. Because we're we're only charging you for what you're telling me you want. Right. You know, so if there was a bunch of stuff you didn't tell me about, right. but you wanted, then I'm going to try to charge you more for it. Right. So right. that doesn't always go over so good. Right. Especially when there's multi layers of, you know, 10 layers of clients right. and then everybody up the, up the, up the post like adds a little bit has to, <laughs> has to then explain to the person above them what right. that it didn't include, you know, social media posts or it didn't include, you know, video. It didn't include design. Right. So I think that, you know, just try to be clear and just look out for that. I think it's just, I feel like contracts are just all about like scope of work nowadays. Right. So being super thorough on the front end with a client. I mean, it's a dance can, though, because you don't want to can. scare them yeah. off. Right. Right, right, right. You know, it's right. a dance. Right. So, <laughs> but just keep in your mind, I guess, like you may, you may not want to go super anal right on I mean, the in some bat, respects, but, you know, that is the spots. benefit of being like, oh, you know, if you're a one man artist team and you know, you and your wife or you and your homie and, right. you know, you can give them those extras. You right, know, right. and, and Maybe, it yeah. might not be any skin off your, of your, your knee, you know, because right. it's not that difficult, but I mean, I guess once you get to a certain point that that can be abused by clients right? Yeah. and, you know, so you have to look out for it and, and at least at a minimum, hopefully they, and, and I, that they understand that you're, you're giving them this thing of right. value and it, you're not just throwing it in. It's not nothing. Right. And I, <laughs> and I think it goes back to what you were saying before with the, with the fine art, have a price. Yeah. Let them know your price for this work and then choose to discount it or waive the fee. Yeah. For whatever reason, good reason you're giving, you're like, right. you know, you're my homie or, you, you know, I know we're going to do this next job or, exactly. you know, we're doing four murals. So I'm going to give you a discount volume discount, right. whatever it is. So they, they feel it. And then also because then that sets a price. And the next time you're like, we well, did that last one for 8K. What's up? Right. You right. Know? Exactly. <laughs> See, that's game right there is just. You know, and I, I can get better at that. It's literally just lay out the t- total scope of work price and then let them chew on that and go, but we'll, we're will we going to do it for this amount. But so, you know, so that way next time you're the precedence isn't set at this low number and they don't realize you that low number is because you want the relationship. Right. I mean, I can't. I mean, end. how I mean, it, it, I'm going to just say it, it, it is probably the right move to often give people an, an, an introductory offer. Right. You right, know what I mean? Right. Let's, you know, let's be real. That works. Yeah. And it's smart because you get your foot in the door and, you know, with somebody that may have other work for you and that, that scope of work is likely to expand. <laughs> right, right, right. And yeah. And, and, you know, in all of this, as we're saying all of this, you know, we haven't talked about it too much, but it's very important too to factor in the relationship that you're trying to build and the possible long-term gain. Like I'm willing to take less up front if I feel that, A, I like the client, I like the relationship, and I believe that we can grow this. And so I tell people, you know, I'd rather get, you know, a smaller gig that turns into five years of gigs than one big-ass gig to where I feel like I got them and they feel like, 
the job was good, but we can't pay that ever again. So we're not going to fuck yeah. with that guy again. So. Those were all about, you know, longevity, you know, we're just all about client satisfaction, but, um, we don't want our artists to be happy, but the, and also how we try to, one of the things we try to make our artists happy is that, you know, we try to give them repeat work, you know? Right. And so we're, we're using the same artists and, um, respecting, you know, that if you did a great job for, you know, General Motors on that other job and General Motors are coming back, then I'm going to put you right. on that job. You know, I'm not right. just going to. Right. Well, you know, thanks. Next. You know, the, the benefit right. of the, the seniority, the ben- you know, we're all about seniority, you right. know, which makes it hard for the young guys sometimes. But, you know, the seniority and the work that you put in, hopefully, you know, you get that benefit. And, and um, yeah, that it makes it hard for the, sometimes for, for pe- new people to break in. Right. In that sense. Yeah, yeah. But I think yeah. still. Got to, hey. Got to earn, got to earn your stripes somewhere. Um, so we got two more good ones, but this has been a, just a, a, a buttload of good gems, and I learn something on every show because everybody has a different proce- a process and just wisdom. Um, so let's just really quickly, what are explain to an artist a little bit, or just share, not explain. What are the benefits for an artist to have a manager or a represent, rep- someone to represent them? Well, uh, I mean, I think, I think it's, people can think of sort of the obvious things, you know, but I think that, uh, I think that it's, it's people understand that when you have a manager, you know, I think they're just willing to pay you more. Right. You know, right, think, right, right, right. I don't, I don't know. I mean, at the same time, people say manager. Oh my God. I don't want to talk to a manager. Right, this guy's right. going to milk me. <laughs> You know, right. or they want to get at the artist, right? It's, right? Everybody wants to get at the artist nowadays, right. of course, on Instagram and so Twitter. <laughs> they have access directly to the artist. And that's right. that's that's what a lot of clients, like the big benefit for them is to interact with this amazing artistic individual, right. which is special. And, and they want to feel like they have a hand in that and they want to have that relationship. So, but I think res- as an artist, I think you should respect what the role that managers play and that they can shield you from like the 10 questions and get right. you that one key question, right? right you know, that right. you, where you really need to be on that call, you know? And that's the thing right. is, that, is that, so we're, we're not putting artists on the call every time, like uh, right. the client requests the artist on the call. Yeah. Cause it, you know, half the time it just turns into some BS and, and, you know, some logistical questions and, and it's a big waste of time, exactly. you know, like yeah. having 10 people on a call and, and the artist is just kind of sitting there and it's like, they want the artist there, of course. Cause th- right. that's like this, this amazing thing in their world is that right. like I interacted like, this with so this insane. artist right. and, and I helped bring him to the table <laughs> and I, I discovered him and stuff. And, and that's great. But I think you're, you're give more of that role to your manager. And then when, when appropriate, you, you come in, you know, right. so that you can keep your head focused on the art. Um, you know, not that to be oblivious what your manager is doing, of course, you know, right. you should always be able to do the work too, but let's, you know, you can't do everything. So, right. you know, it'll, it'll give you more volume, you know, because then you can focus on the art and, um, and just be okay when, when those jobs, when, when you don't get those jobs, right. Trust, you know, because right. the, you, if you're going to, with a manager, once you come up to the point of where you have a manager or a, or a, a crew or a company representing you you're going to have to go for the bigger fish, right. you know, and, and you're not going to get every job and, and you can't cry over that. Right. You know, you, you got to let them go. You know, it's, it's going to be maybe fewer jobs, but for hopefully for more money. Right. Right. You know, and hopefully more better managed, better clients, you know, just the ease of the job, right. Like that everything isn't crazy, hopefully, even though it's, it might still be, right, right. but you know, isn't as crazy. Let's just say as if, if, um, if you just try to do everything yourself. Right. That's real. Um, so last question, what, looking back at this 30 year run you've had, what would you say is one of your biggest mistakes along the way? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. It's tough. It's like, I've not, never, having, I've never made a mistake. not having good salespeople, I guess. Yeah. Not really having salespeople. I think, um, that's, I, I'm still grappling with that. I mean, right. we're essentially word of mouth for 30 years, <laughs> right, right, right. Which is great, and it's in, in one sense, but you know, just to try to embrace some aspect of that corporate mentality of like having a sales team, and right. you know, like 
that's what I, I we're trying to trying to move towards some aspect of that now i guess you right could say. well you get bragging rights we've been around for 30 years only on word of mouth it's kind of like the <laughs> dj like this is our dj set only vinyl well, I mean, the the, is, the competition is ruthless out there, and yeah. there's like tons of other there's other companies that are, are blown up right, like ten right. times what we're doing, you know, like or more, right? And, you know, it just you got to be it's it's hard so now you, know, you look at social media and you compare yourself. And I, we all go through this on so many different yeah. levels these days, but you know, you have to be good with what you're doing and and you know you know find the value in it in terms of what what is that true? What is driving you? You know. For me, friends and family does drive me still, and that we're still working with friends and family, and that we're still helping support the graffiti art community. Um, that means a lot to me. I think that helps drive me, um, and that we're putting good artwork out there in the community, not just any bullshit, basically. So right. hopefully, you know, hopefully you can stand by some of some ideals. It's it's tough in this in this capitalist world to right. maintain some of those things. Right to navigate the you know the culture and the and the corporate. Yeah, make some type of you know harmony with it. Okay, well on our outro. We always ask our people like, "What is like? What is a quote that is resonating with you over your times?" If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Dang, there you go. If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. <laughs> That's real. From, from my brother Sugar Free. Hey, hey, he's gonna be in Berkeley in like a couple of weeks. Well, I just recently learned he is a Northern California, Oakland, North Oakland boy himself. Oh, really? Yeah, I did not know that. Dell yeah. Dell was a ginormous Sugar Free fan, so yeah, I got a lot of Sugar Free on tour. I got I got I got caught up. His I early life time. was in North Oakland. I, I recently learned, and then now he's all about Pomona, where I was born. Right. But, so I always liked him. Right. I mean, shit, y'all might need, might be related. <laughs> <I> could be. <laughs> all right, y'all. This is episode two of Art to Empire. Stash ICU Buku One. Peace. I turned my heart into an empire. 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 Uncle Dad's lucky verse. I turned my heart into an empire. Yes. I turned my heart into an empire. 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 The podcast is here to unearth the clues to share gems, wisdom from those who pay dues to the kings and queens. Behind the scenes who've done the work, planted seeds and built the dream.